Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was a Green Party candidate for president in 2020. And in these podcasts, we continue to talk about how to advance a green socialist agenda, the kind of thing that we ran on in 2020. And uh, in terms of what went on this week, we just had the passing of uh, <clears throat> Richard Trump, the head of the AFL-CIO. I think you can acknowledge that he's probably the most progressive head of the AFL-CIO since they merged in the early 50s. On the other hand, a lot left to be desired. I mean, throughout his career uh, as head of the mine workers, he, he got them on board with uh, the anti-apartheid movement and sanctions against South Africa. Uh, he did speak out against uh, people in his uh, let's see, by then he was still, well, he was, by then he was Secretary of Treasury of the AFL-CIO. He made some good speeches in 2008 telling, you know, white people in the labor movement they had a problem if they couldn't vote for a black man. Not that we supported Obama, but Trump was pretty good on, pretty good on racial issues, but not really. You know, last year uh, when the question of the relationship of police unions, who are not only racist, most of them, but also not in solidarity with the rest of the labor movement. And he was having, uh, he just, you know, incorporated them, defended their, their role in the AFL-CIO without really trying to do anything about it. So, you know, on, on the question of race and class, he was pretty good. Um, in terms of getting the labor movement moving again by emphasizing grassroots, uh, organizing at the shop floor, getting members involved in our unions, because a lot of union leadership doesn't want the members involved because they get organized, they might elect new leadership. So they tend to, the, the, the default position is to go to outside consultants and do corporate campaigns to embarrass companies that we're struggling with instead of using workers' power to organize and if need be, strike. <clears throat> so Trunka didn't help too much there. And then the other thing he was really not good on is the climate crisis and environmental issues. I mean, imagine Tony Mazaki, for those of you who remember him, who was top official in the oil, chemical, and atomic workers. And he's the one we got the just transition from, that workers displaced from toxic industries, from fossil fuel industries, from military industries, if we ever have peace conversion, that their wages and benefits should be secured for at least five years after uh, they lose their job. So there's a just transition for workers to new lines of work. Trump could never embrace that. In fact, when the watered down Green New Deal that AOC and Markey introduced in the Congress, he had uh, two of his uh, union people. One was uh, the guy that hits the mine workers. And I'm forgetting right now who the other one, they, they wrote a you know very public letter saying they didn't like the Green New Deal. And then when uh, Keystone was shut down, you know, all he, he sounded like Trump, Trump and Trumpka. You know, what about those jobs? Now, there should have been a just transition for those largely Teamsters that were working on that project. There wasn't. That's a problem with the Biden administration, problem with the whole approach to uh, the way we deal with uh, this whole transition to clean energy and the other changes we need to make for environmentalism. But if that was Tony Mazaki, as a counterexample, you know, he'd had the labor movement out front on that. Trumpka was very conservative. So I, that's sort of a balance sheet on Richard Trumpka, and uh, we'll see who the AFL puts in his place. I'm not sure. I haven't really looked to see who might be. But, uh, you know, labor movement, in, in, unless it starts really organizing its members and doing outreach, because right now it's got less of the private workforce organized than we had in the 1920s. It's pretty pathetic. So labor movement needs needs help. So this weekend, they're calling it an infrastructure weekend because one way or another, the Senate people are going to uh, adopt a um, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, which has next, next to nothing on climate. It's all roads, bridges, airports, a little bit of uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, charging stations. Um, and then they're, the progressives are saying they're going to pair that to the reconciliation bill, which Sanders says they want to be 
trillion over 10 years. And uh, that remains to be seen. We haven't seen the details of what Sanders is working on with the other senators. And we're probably not going to see that till September. And then the bipartisan bill, if it is tied to the reconciliation bill, the Democrats can pass on their own if they get Manchin and Cinema and some others on board. I mean, this is all is going to happen till September. So it's not moving very quickly. And we still don't know what actually is going to be in the reconciliation bill, the one the Democrats are going to try to pass with 51 Senate votes, including Vice President Harris. Meanwhile, voting rights is going nowhere fast. The only thing that changed since I talked about this last week is that the Biden administration said they will have the census data to the states four days earlier, which means the Republicans who control 30 of the state legislatures can start gerrymandering four days earlier. And that's going to gerrymander the Democrats right out of the House unless they could pass the For the People Act, which we were promised this week they'd have a stripped down version that apparently, and this is something Joe Manchin worked a lot on, would get rid of the part we object to, the public campaign financing system that really excluded the Green Party and got down to some of the you know most important things, the Disclose Act, which would require the disclosure of dark money, uh, some of the uh, restrictions of voter suppression laws that the states are passing. They're talking about a provision there that would stop states like Georgia from basically taking over the boards of election throughout the state. The Republicans taking them over. The way the state board is set up now under the new law, four of the five state board of election people are Republicans, and they have the power to take away the power of county boards of election. So guess who they're going after? The county boards of election in cities like Atlanta, where the you know Democrats got the vote. They are, you know, planning to steal the next elections. And uh, the gerrymandering that entrenches the power of the minority party, the Republicans, in many of these states uh, is going forward. The Before the People Act has a restriction against partisan gerrymandering, and Manchin was part of that. But we haven't seen that bill. They said we'd see it this week. I don't know what's holding it up, but they still haven't got a bill to debate, let alone try to get a carve out of the filibuster so they could pass it, which nobody seems to be talking about. And, you know, I've talked here about Joe Manchin, I mean, Joe Biden doing a speech on voting rights in Philadelphia and never mentioned in the filibuster. And then the next week you get asked at a CNN town meeting about it. And he says, oh, we get rid of the filibuster, it'd be chaos and gridlock. Like, that's not what we already got. So it doesn't seem like Biden is going to put any effort behind getting rid of the filibuster, even for carving out voting rights legislation. So the Republicans are out there doing their thing in the states, voter suppression, election subversion, partisan gerrymandering, and they are going to have uh, power in state and federal governments way beyond their numbers. They're a minority party in most, in nationally, and in many of these states where they have the control that's you know, like it's a 50-50 state like Wisconsin. But because the Republicans gerrymander those uh, legislative districts in the state, if I remember the number right, the Democrats got 54% of the votes for the state legislature. They ended up with 38% of the seats because the Republicans drew the lines and they just packed all the Democrats into districts so the Republicans could win all the rest of them. That's what they're doing. Um, and they're setting up to do in 2024, what Trump, in his bumbling, incompetent way, tried to do in 2020, and that is flip the presidential election. I mean, we know now the generals are worried he's going to try to invoke the military. General Flynn was saying that openly. We now have uh, the correspondence within the Justice Department. Trump was trying to get them to decertify some state election results. Fortunately, the the civil service lifers, I don't know if they call them civil service at the federal level, but the, the professional staff at Justice said, no, we're not going to do that. But uh, now they can do it by controlling state legislatures through gerrymandering, congressional delegation through gerrymandering. And when they get to the Congress and they have to certify election results in 2024, they could just reject some states that, 
you know, if it's Biden running again, one, he might win the whole election. They can reject the states like Trump wanted to do this time and declare the Republican the winner. And then, you know, we've got a real banana republic situation. So this is serious. And the Democrats don't seem to have the urgency to get something done on voting rights. So that's all pretty negative. I, I, I'll close on one positive thing. I think we got to give props to Cory Bush for uh, sitting there on the Capitol steps, drawing the nation's attention to the eviction moratorium that expired. I talked about that last weekend. And by the end of the weekend, she forced Biden to extend it by 60 days. Now, the reality is he, Biden just kicked it down the road. The courts may knock it down. The landlords are already in court and the Supreme Court uh, has taken their side in, in, elect, in uh, cases that would be a case law they could refer to. Uh, they say the government, federal government doesn't have the authority to do this moratorium. So it may be kicked down the road until the courts knock it down. Or if it lasts 60 days, what then? It's not like in the next 60 days, the 11 or 15 million people, whoever you, you know, whichever source you cite, uh, the people are behind on their rent and can't catch up. It's not like they're going to get all that money in the next 60 days. What happens then? There is a bill that Ilhan Omar put in, cancel rent and mortgage is what it's called. And what it does is have the federal government pay those rent and mortgage bills for people who can't pay. So the landlords and the banks uh, get what they need, that whole industry. You don't have dominoes falling because landlords and banks and the uh, you know uh, people that depend on property management, whether it's you know you, the, the landlords, jack of all trades that goes in and repairs, or plumbers, or uh, people that deal with gas. You know if they can't get paid, you know they're hurt. It, it could be a whole domino effect. So Ilhan Omar has a great bill, but of course Pelosi didn't let it get out of committee because when they did that. Uh, COVID relief package early in the year, they didn't have anything like what uh, Ilhan Omar put in. So, you know, direct action gets the goods, but we're not out of the woods. So I'll stop there and, and be happy to take questions. Living in furnace. Rent will at best be due right before October 15 general strike. I was actually on a call with some people last night i think it may be a different because they weren't putting a date about a general strike and you know more power to you if you can pull it off i'm skeptical i know that uh the vermont afl cio passed a resolution as we approach the uh, 2020 presidential election and and it was directed to trump and the national afl cio saying labor should lead a general strike if trump tries a coup and San Francisco Central Labor Council, Seattle Central Labor Council, some others uh, endorsed that resolution. The response of Trumka and the tops in the AFL-CIO executive board was to threaten to discipline the Vermont AFL-CIO, even threatening their charter for taking that position. And I know I've studied general strikes. You've always got labor involved, whether it's uh, one of these strikes that grows out of a particular labor dispute, like the Minneapolis general strike where the Teamsters were organizing trucking hubs and uh, got brutally repressed and the whole labor movement came out in solidarity or the general strike in, in the UK in 1926 that was led by their National Trade Union Council or these general strikes we hear about, you know, France pulls them off a lot, Italy, uh, but those are really demonstrations It's one or two days. So yeah, I mean, October 15th would be a good time for people to come out on general strike, but people trying to make rent, can they afford a day off work? You got to, I mean, I've been in, in unions, the Teamsters, and I know when we just talk about strikes over contracts, a lot of guys are saying, uh, I can't afford to go on strike. I need that full pay. Even with a strike fund and getting some payments, they would be in trouble. So. That is a big organizing task, and I doubt it can be done by October 15th. Although the one thing I think we should be prepared is if 
this voting rights and election subversion scenario that the Republicans are trying to pull off plays out, the labor movement should lead a general strike if, if they attempt to flip the election in 2024. So I think it's something we should be talking about, but not underestimating what it takes to organize a general strike. Z Manny, we need someone to write a book on the history of third parties since the 1990s to clarify the achievement of the Greens in this landscape. Maybe Nader should write it to get greater publicity. Hmm. You know, I hadn't planned to run for president. I planned to write a little history of the Green Party, which of course would have gone into all the other efforts at third parties that were started and failed while the Greens were plugging away. And if I ever get to that, I don't know if, you know, I could co-write it with Ralph Nader. He might write an introduction, uh, but that would get it some attention for sure. I think that's a great idea. And it, that book needs to be written. And uh, I hope I get the chance to do it. We'll, we'll have to see what, what happens, you know, whether I run in 2024 or going to decide that after the midterms. We got a huge battle here in New York to get the Green Party ballot line back. New York now has the most onerous ballot access requirements, not only of any state in the nation, but any nation in the world that I can find. I mean, this is prohibitive. We have to get 45,000 signatures in 42 days next April and May. Richard Winger recently pointed out in something he wrote that in 2020, there wasn't a single petition for a presidential ballot line or any down ballot ballot line that got more than 5,000 signatures that required, needed more than 5,000 signatures and successfully got on a ballot. And most of those petition drives, most states give you six months at least. Some a year, some have no uh, start date. We have a 42 day period in New York, uh, which makes it doubly, triply difficult. So, uh, that's, you know, th those are those things I got to deal with before I even think about what happens in 2024 and whether I got time to write this book. But it's a book I agree. It needs to be written. Lee Shoran, do you think Matt Gates is guilty for the crimes he is blamed for? Well, from reading the press, it doesn't look good for that guy. And the fact that he's out there... Uh, I mean, which crime are you talking about? <coughs> I mean, sex with an underage girl uh, doing drugs with her is one of the allegations. But, you know, the crimes, the big lies he's talking about. I mean, it's not formally a crime, but saying Trump won the election, running around with uh, Marjorie Green, whatever her name is, out of Georgia with their crazy conspiracy things. I mean, those, those are criminal. They're unethical. They're, they're wrong. So he's definitely guilty of that. Cause that's, you know, we can see that. <coughs> the revolution continues blog. Ohio gives a very short windows to collect a large number of signatures to get an independent on a ballot which is what the Greens are forced to do here. That's in Ohio. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the framework is there. Um, I know when, when we were running for president, we were trying to get the Ohio Green Party to put favorite sons and daughters on the petition and start petitioning. And they couldn't seem to get that done. So by the time we got the formal nomination and they had uh, just a few weeks to get the signatures and they kind of put a deadline on themselves. But uh, if you know what the window is, type it in and, and we can talk about it. But as far as I'm aware, the only state that has a shorter than six month type, uh, timeline besides New York is Texas. <coughs> and it seemed, you know, off the top of my head, I seem to remember it's 78 days. Violet at Content Boutique. Could filing suit in New York to ease those requirements be a possibility? It's a reality. Uh, we are suing with the Libertarian Party, 
The Working Families Party has a lawsuit. The Serve America movement has a lawsuit. So these are working their ways through the courts. We're not getting a good result. Frankly, the judge that has our case, he's not even reading our briefs. And, you know, what I found out where we had ballot access fights in the states, if the Board of Election had anything to do with it, they were tied because most of these states are bipartisan. So it goes to the courts and the judges voted strictly on partisan lines. The facts and the law be damned. And so we got screwed in Montana and Pennsylvania and in Minnesota and in Wisconsin because one Republican joined the Democrats. The, the Republicans control the Supreme Court there four to three, but one of the Republicans flipped, which kind of surprised me. I thought we were going to win that just because of the experience with these hack judges voting their party position. But uh, I really wonder what went on in the back rooms because what we heard about the Wisconsin Supreme Court is they physically have come to blows behind the scenes over cases. And uh, Republicans and Democrats have no love lost between each other there. But somehow they got one of those Republicans to flip over. I wonder what the real story of that is. I mean, the, the, what was going on in the background was the Supreme Court was sitting on our case for eight days as it approached the absentee ballot mailing deadline. And the Democrats and the executive director of the Elections Commission, she put out a memo saying something like 378,000 ballots had already been mailed. And the Wisconsin or the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, their biggest newspaper, actually, well, the Supreme Court had said, uh, boards of election, tell us if you've mailed any out. And uh, the Journal Sentinel actually called boards of election. They found out none had been mailed out. So this was kind of a setup. And then when we got, when they finally got to our case, it's like two days before the mailing deadline. And they said, well, it's too late. So we're not going to consider the merits of your case. We're just going to say you're too late and you're off the ballot. And I just wonder how that Republican, why he flipped over. Um, there must have been some deal in the background. But whatever it was, nobody's reported on it. <clears throat> Carnival Cash Humphreys. Thoughts on the New York mayoral election? mayoral election so far. Well, uh, Adams is going to win the general. Uh, that guardian angel guy. Um, what's his name? Curtis Sliwa? Yeah, there's no way he's going to win. So I think we know who the mayor is. It's Adams. Um, I think the ranked choice vote within the Democratic primary was, was good. It was interesting. There was an exit poll that showed 95% of the voters found the ballot simple to fill out, and 77% want to keep using ranked choice voting. And it was almost a big upset. Garcia was actually in third place when they counted the first round, a little bit behind Maya Wiley. And as they went through the, uh, you know, the uh, tallying rounds, you know, everybody got eliminated and their second choice was allocated until more of those people's second choices supported Garcia over Wiley, who was the most progressive in the race. So it ended up being uh, Garcia and Adams in the end. And it was like 51 to 49% or 50.5% to 49.5%. And on election day, he was like 31 and she was like 19. So it did show there was uh, Adams. Adams has a thin mandate. And you got to watch the, you know, the establishment Democrats are saying, see, he was pro-police um, and he's, you know, a Joe Biden Democrat. Therefore, you know, the progressives are losing ground. Of course, they're reiterating that with uh, what happened with uh, Nina Turner last Tuesday. I mean, one of the things, there's a great article in American Prospect on how the dark money, super PAC money really went after Nina Turner millions of dollars in negative campaigning against her. It seems to have turned the tide. So that's another thing. Uh, you know, one of the things we say in ranked choice voting is it doesn't pay to go negative if you're a candidate because you want the second choices of your opponents or their third choices. 
And the problem is with these super PACs that are nominally independent of the candidates, they can go as negative as they want, and the candidates have plausible deniability. That's not me. I didn't talk to them. But, of course, these super PACs, they, they, they don't directly have to talk to know what the messaging is or what the negative messaging needs to be. And, in fact, this, the interesting thing about this American Prospect article, it, it, the title was something about red box. Sean L. Brown, the woman who won, had a red box on her website basically saying, here's what's wrong with uh, Nina Turner and people need to get the word out. It's like a me and, then, and then the super PACs, you know, did that messaging. So it wasn't a direct communication to them, but they could hardly miss it. When I say red box, literally a box with a, you know, a red line around it. Um, so look that up in, in American Prospect. I, I can't remember the author's name. He writes good stuff, and it came out this week. And just go to the American Prospect website, and it'll it's a real eye-opener to how corrupt, you know, this uh, legalized bribery of private campaign financing is. So that's getting off the New York mayoral election. But, yeah, Adams is going to be the mayor with a mandate that is pretty narrow. And we'll see if he uh, recognizes that or he doubles down on, you know, what he won with and, and alienates a lot of the base he'll need to get reelected. Z Manny, are other third parties in New York lining, against, lining up against their new ballot access policy? It would be good to unite behind a media campaign to build public pressure. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been talking with uh, libertarians and another group called Unite New York, which is part of Unite, I think it's Unite US or America. And I don't agree with them on a lot of things. They're for ranked choice voting. They're also for these top four, or top five primaries, which is going to be bad for third parties. Because if you're a small party and you don't make the top four or five, you aren't in the general election. I think every party should have an opportunity in the general election. Um, but, you know, they have some money and interest in making ballot access easier. So uh, I'm not the right person to talk to working families. Maybe some New York City Greens can talk to them. They're kind of working on their own path. Um, but I'm not sure enthusiastically because they can get on a ballot by cross-endorsing the Green gubernatorial and presidential candidates, which they always do. Same with the conservative party. They do with the Republican side. Um, who am I leaving out that's a third party in New York? There was an independence party, but that was kind of a transactional party. I'm not sure they're trying to get back on the ballot. Um, and they're not very principled. So anyway, yeah, we are, we are working with uh, and open to working with the other third parties to get a new ballot access policy. I have on my... Uh, website under the policy what's it called policy yeah under issues and then go under policy papers i testified before the new york state senate elections committee on wednesday and i gave them a real piece of my mind about the fair ballot access and i also talked about nonpartisan election administration ranked choice voting proportional representation and making our ballots simpler by having aggregated fusion instead of disaggregated fusion. Now, there are only eight states with fusion, so some of you won't even know what I'm talking about, but that's where more than one party can nominate a candidate who appears on the ballot, and the ballot identifies that party's nomination. In aggregate, disaggregated states like New York, every party has a line, and then the candidate appears in their column for their office uh, after each party's line. So, for example, I've run against Andrew Cuomo. He's always on about four times. I'm on there once for the Green Party. He's got Democrat, working families, independents, and uh, some third party they create by petition. Um, aggregated fusion is where each candidate appears once on the ballot, and under their name are the parties that nominated them. They do that in Oregon, for example. So, you know, I recommended they go to 
aggregated fusion in New York because one of the objections to having ranked choice voting in the general as well as primaries, New York City's ranked choice voting is not going to be used in the general election. So we have green candidates in New York City who are up against the spoiler problem. They wouldn't have been if they'd had ranked choice voting. So, but the objection of the Democrats primarily in New York City was, well, we don't know how to do that uh, with the ballot infusion. Well, they did know how to do it. The Charter Commission was told that you used to do that, aggregated fusion, when you had proportional representation through multi-member ranked choice voting in New York City between 19, five elections between 1937 and 1945. So I don't think it was that they didn't know how to do it or it would make the ballot too complicated. No, they didn't want the competition from parties like the Greens. We have proportional representation in New York City. You know, a good 10 or 20 percent of the council at least would be green. So that's why they didn't do it. But uh, so anyway, I gave these senators a piece of my mind. And I can tell by the body language, some of them really didn't like it because I was telling them off. You know, I told them that that law y'all passed, and that's what I said. Y'all passed this law that is not only the most difficult of any state in the nation, any nation in the world that I can find. And the chairman of the committee, he, he avoided eye contact with me as I said that. So, but sometimes you just got to tell them the way it is. A couple of the senators, you know, I think were more interested in what I was saying. I talked to them afterwards. <coughs> And I think with one of them, I can really work to maybe get a, you know, ballot access legislation that this senator can introduce. And then we can campaign around in 2022 and pressure the so-called progressive Democrats, the DSA Democrats who have been silent on this issue, you know, to, to support fair ballot access or be called out for being voter suppressors because suppressing parties is suppressing votes. So. Yeah, we're going to work with other parties, and, and the Greens are going to have their own message out there, too. Jordan David, who to vote for in California recall? <coughs> Even voting, no, we have to pick someone. Green Party has not produced a viable candidate. And then Mike Feinstein says Dan Kapilovitz is the leading Green has his Twitter number there. And I remember Mike pointing him out. Uh, I think there may be two greens. So uh, if you don't like Dan Kapilovitz, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I, I haven't looked at the candidates. Um, I'm here in New York. I got enough problems here. But good luck in California. Vicki Corden, what about green candidates in Florida? There were not that many in 2020. Yeah, I've been encouraging uh, locals to run candidates. And if you're not, you know, in a position like in 2020 to run somebody for Congress, uh, I don't know whether your local election are in odd years like they are in New York with state and federal and even years or whether they're all the same year. But we got to start at the local level because we can win those races. We have about 115 Greens in elected office right now. And it wouldn't be hard to get that into the thousands and then create a base there for viable candidates for state legislatures and Congress. Um, it's important that we run. It's important that that's not the only thing we need to do. As I've been saying all along, we need to be out there talking to voters, deep canvassing, going out and Listening, not just preaching at them, building relationships, uh, demonstrating that we're concerned about the issues by being active between elections as well as during elections. But we also got to run candidates. You know, this discussion last night on the general strike, uh, you know, these people were saying we got to do direct action. The, the squad and the progressive Democrats aren't getting it done. And, uh, you know, they were saying how all this pressure would, you know, like, Cory Bush's sitting on the Capitol steps is, you know, we got to make it uncomfortable for them. But I pointed out that 
you know, we've had massive demonstrations like against the Iraq war during the buildup. But the Democrats, most of them voted for the war. And we moved, we moved from a core of 25 against the war to 125 over a year of very intense organizing and lobbying. But still, it wasn't a majority of the Democrats opposed to the war in the House. And that's because if we don't have candidates that threaten to take votes from them, the Democrats can ignore us. You know, what are we going to do, vote for Republicans? So that's why we've got to run candidates. And, you know, Florida, you need to talk to the Greens in Florida. Uh, I, I do know they have had some some candidates. I, I'm not up on what's going on this year or next. But, yeah, Greens got to run candidates as well as do those other things for sure. Vivian and Furnace, can we take the time to run local in the next few years and still get a Green New Deal? Millennials like me face elderly, elderly years of turmoil. Yeah, well, I think it's before you get to be elderly, brother or sister. I don't know what living in furnace is, what gender that is, but um, we're in it. I mean, these fires, these floods, and the temperatures rising faster than the International Panel on Climate Change projected with its models. Um, and we're reaching tipping points like Arctic ice, Arctic ice melting. And when the ice is gone, instead of it reflecting heat back into the atmosphere, the light color, the dark color absorbs it, heats up the Arctic Ocean faster, things like that. So we're in it. That's number one. Um, and, yeah, we got to – I mean, that's why I think it was important for us to run for president, try to get – you know, our eco-socialist Green New Deal into the debate. Can't say we were very successful, except on the independent left. Um, and even there, uh, I think we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, but you can run on a Green New Deal locally. You can have a local Green New Deal. You can, you can have, you know, mandate your planning agency to uh, come up with a plan to get to zero emissions by 2030 or, you know, soon thereafter, and then spell out what the city can do with the resources it has and what the city needs from the federal government to complete the plan. And then put that to your representatives in Congress and your senators and the president. And if we can do that in a lot of local communities, uh, we can begin to move on some of these issues. One of the things I've been talking with some uh, Greens around the country that have been doing this at the local level, I recommend that people say that their planning agency or committee or whoever it is that approves development plans need to change their focus from being a rubber stamp for what developers offer and becoming the real planning agency and saying this is what we need for walkable uh, neighborhoods, which are energy and resource efficient, to have grocery stores in every neighborhood so we get rid of the food deserts. Uh, to have mass transit options instead of everybody depending on a car. You can you can say, you can lay out, here's what we want to do, then ask for bids from builders and uh, developers. So we're doing the planning and they're doing the building instead of them doing the, the planning and the building. Because what they plan is what we've got, segregation, sprawl, and an environmental disaster. So I think that's something we can do in about every level of uh, local government. So I think what millennials and the rest of us need to do is, you know, keep making demands on the federal government, but start, you know, developing a program for your own community and try to start to implement it. And that will create a lot more pressure than just us, you know, phone calling Schumer or having a little demonstration with the Sunrise Movement or whoever. Um, that means real action by local governments. And if you're in local government, the politicians higher up know you're in there because you got support, which means they got to pay attention. So I think that's one thing we can do right now. And Living Furnace, in Furnace says, what I mean is major droughts, floods every year, agriculture consistently unable to match demand, 
water running totally dry. Yeah, and all I'm saying is it may be coming faster than it's going to come before you're elderly. That's my concern because, uh, you know, the, what did I see? I saw a graphic. I think it was in the New York Times. It's like 10% of the earth is now uninhabitable. By 2050, it's going to be like 25%, particularly the tropical regions. And uh, so all those people, you know, in Central America, the Caribbean, West Africa, East Africa, Southern India, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, uh, Papua New Guinea and the, and the islands there in the Pacific, they're going to be so damn hot you can't, as a human being, survive. You know, maybe with air conditioning, but most of them don't have it, they can't afford it, and they're never going to get it in time. So we're in this. We're in this climate crisis. That's all I'm saying. Carrie Chet Campbell, the other Green Party member on the ballot for governor in California is Heather Collins. Okay, thank you for the information. I don't know her. I'm not going to comment. Hello, Howie. Are the Australian Greens affiliated? This is Strongflower. Hello, Howie. Are the Australian Greens affiliated with the reparations of Australian aboriginals in a similar, similar manner to the American Greens' support of U.S. black reparations? I don't know the answer to that. I do know that the Australian Greens are concerned about reparations for uh, the global south. They are giving money to the Papua uh, New Guinea Greens Party. Uh, they just gave $10,000 to them. If you go on my website, I have a, an appeal for Americans to send them some money. They still need to raise a few thousand dollars for their Congress at the end of this month. The Papua New Guinea Greens are the only party there that is feminist, uh, pro-LGBTQ, uh, wants a different development model than, uh, you know, tearing down the rainforest and replacing it with palm oil plantations, which is an ecological disaster. They have a different development model. They now have a member of the uh, Papua New Greens parliament, and they're getting ready for elections next year. If you find that article on my campaign website, HowieHawkins.us, uh, take a read and see if you can't contribute some money. You got to wire it to them. Um, they can use it. As far as uh, reparations for Australian Aboriginals and the Australian Green Party, I don't know. But I'm sure you can find out online by going to their website and looking at their platform. <clears throat> Lee Shoran, do you think Congress and Senate could get a limit like president, term limit? Because a lot of them been there for years. Oh, man, yes. And we, you know, the, the history of this country is these Southern Dixiecrats, because they had seniority, running all the committees in the Senate and the House and obstructing progress from a minority position. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea of 12-year term limits for both members of Congress and the Senate. So it'd be two six-year terms for senators and six two-year terms for members of the House. I think that's long enough for House members to become competent at their job. You don't want them in there for too short a period because the K Street lobbyists are there 24-7. And they know the ins and outs. They know the people. I mean, it's very hard not to get bamboozled by these slick, you know, lobbyists, unless you've been there for a while and, and know some people you can talk to to get, you know, figure out what's going on. So I think 12 years is a good uh, term limit time for members of Congress. Mary L. Sanders, green candidates can consult the GPUS Eco Action Committee for their Green New Deal platform help. Um, Okay, there, there is a committee to do equal action. They have a call out right now for people to call Schumer, put more money into the climate action parts of these uh, infrastructure bills. Um, personally, I recommend the Eco Socialist Green New Deal budget that I ran on.
frankly, from what I've seen, it's the most detailed uh, Green New Deal plan out there. We show our homework. We come up with what we think are realistic costs. And we explain, you know, why we uh, came up with those numbers and what it would do in all sectors of production, not just power production of electricity, but the manufacturing, transportation, buildings, and agricultural sectors, which often get forgotten. The production of power is 27% of the country's carbon footprint. Transportation is 29. I think manufacturing is 22. Buildings are next and agriculture is the least. But the thing about agriculture is it can become a, a carbon sink if it goes to regenerative organic practices and rebuilds carbon rich soils. Um, so even though it's it's like 11 percent of our carbon footprint, it can not only reduce that to zero, it can go negative, which is what we need right now, because if James Hansen's target the climate scientist that was at NASA for a long time, his target of 350 parts per million is the goal. We're, we're at 420 parts per million now. So we not only have to stop putting carbon out, we got to bring the carbon in the atmosphere down to have a safe climate. So, uh, so I'd say if you're looking for details, look there. Um, again, I'll recommend something I wrote. I wrote, I think it was 9,500 words on Biden's American Jobs Plan and his phony pledge to cut emissions by 50% by 2030. And the article's titled, Biden's Climate Pledge is a Promise He Cannot Keep. That's on the campaign website. And that goes into great detail of what's wrong with what we're getting from not just Biden, but the progressive Democrats, because they want to do what Biden's doing. They just want to throw more money at it. And what they're doing is really throwing money at corporations and doing it in a market context when what we really need is planning and coordination so that transportation and public housing to build walkable communities and uh, rebuilding manufacturing sectors that are carbon intensive, like steel and cement, is coordinated. It requires social ownership and public planning. So that's what we propose in that proposal. And I discussed that in this article that I mentioned. <coughs> and the other thing among many that I point out is <coughs> Biden's plan is very fiscally conservative. The number he got, which at that point was $2.3 trillion, was based on what he thought he could get from corporate taxes. And that's the pay-go policy of Congress which means you can't spend money until you've covered it with taxes. <clears throat> We're in a situation where we got to spend this money even if we have to borrow it because the climate crisis is on us. And the more we dally, the more it's going to cost us in the end because destroying farmland and land where people don't even live is a lot more expensive than borrowing some money to put the proper investments in for clean energy and clean production. Zimani, do you think the ongoing Fukushima leak is another major global threat, potentially on a par with climate change? I know you wrote on this, but I'm asking about the scale of this threat. Well, it's leaking radioactivity into the ocean. It wants to take all that radioactive fluids that they've got in storage tanks because the storage tanks are filling up and they say they want to, quote unquote, slowly release it into the ocean which is the old corporate answer to pollution. Their solution to pollution is dilution. But that doesn't mean those uh, radioactive uh, materials go away, except very slowly as, as the half-lives of those radioactive molecules uh, degrade them into more stable uh, non-radioactive uh, materials. Um, I think I would say climate change is a bigger threat. It's just bigger, it covers the whole globe. It's on a scale much bigger than Fukushima, as big as that is. So, I mean, if I got to rank them, I would say 
climate change is a bigger threat to all of us. But the Fukushima disaster is not over. Um, besides the, the storage tanks I mentioned, groundwater infiltrates through the radioactive uh, cores that melted down, gets radioactive, and then keeps seeping its way into the ocean. So it's already releasing that radioactivity. And uh, that's not good. And they don't really have an idea how they're going to fix it. It's going to go on for decades like Chernobyl. You know, Chernobyl's still hot. And they buried a lot of it, but uh, they're still having problems containing it. Patricia Fichter. I think MPP, Movement for People's Party, should be our allies. We got to be very aware of what smears... What is smears and what isn't? Yeah, you always got to do that. And uh, I think the local MPP groups vary. I think we really got to do this at the local level. That's the way we're going to, I think, build alliances. You know, we tried to talk to Nick Bronya of the you know National People's Party or Movement for People's Party about our campaign. And he wasn't interested. He did his convention, didn't want us there. So it takes two sides to be allies. On the other hand, I have a good relationship with MPP people here in New York. So I think that's where we got to build the uh, relationship. Video game Vision Quest. MPP is directly opposed to the Green Party. They're an op. Uh, well, I, I, at the national level, that's been my experience. On the other hand, I think a lot of people have gotten involved locally because they do want to see an independent party on the left like we and the Greens are trying to build. So I think you got to make a distinction between the tops and the grassroots. MPP and Jimmy Dore are trying to connect people to the alt-right. I think that's definitely a problem. I mean, Jimmy Dore had that Boogaloo boy on. Uh, he had seemed to love, what's her name, Tulsi Gabbard, who's now going on Fox News. Last thing she did before leaving Congress was an anti-trans bill. That was going nowhere. She introduced it in December, right before she left. That was more messaging. And she loves the authoritarians like Morsi and Modi and Assad. Um, and she's been on Fox News a lot lately saying the, the mayor of uh, Chicago is an anti-white racist and should resign. Uh, she's against... Yeah, I... I Anyway, she's getting involved in racial politics with the Fox News line. So, but, you know, Jimmy Dore was saying she was a good candidate. I don't know why he couldn't see through that. And MPP, uh, they do say they can reach some Republicans. I don't know about alt-right, you know, from the top. I, I haven't seen that, but uh, I'd be interested to know who, who they've related to if they have. Gary Brown, Howie Hawkins, isn't it true that the People's Party don't have enough money to fund even one House candidate? I did see that in an article in Washington Babylon. Uh, their, their reports to the IRS, because they're a 501c or a 527 organization, they got a report to the IRS, uh, you know, like 70 or 80,000, which you know, really is nothing. I mean, the Green Party is pretty broke, but, you know, we raise that kind of money in, you know, local state parties and nationally all the time. So uh, that's what was reported there. And you can look that up. It just came out this week, Washington Babylon. Forget the author's name, but Washington Babylon's uh, Ken Silverstein's baby. Ken was a help start counterpunch with uh, Alex Coburn back in the day. He's written a lot of great articles. The one I remember the most is he wrote it for Harper's about how Vernon Jordan uh, took Barack Obama around to be vetted with the Washington elite and really set him up for his, this is right before the, you know, he started running for the 2008 presidential race. That was great reporting. Um, so anyway, what I'm saying is that Washington Babylon's, uh, I think, a reliable source and, uh, so check that out. And uh, that's the only report I've seen on their money. I just actually saw that this week.
How should we relate to the Cuban people and the Cuban revolution? Well, we should be in solidarity with the people. That means lifting the sanctions, this blockade the U.S. has had on Cuba for 40, 60 years. Uh, the stated purpose is to move Cuba toward democracy. I think all these kind of sanctions, along with the other things we did, like try to assassinate Fidel Castro and other Cuban leaders, invade them with the Bay of Pigs, terrorist activities by people on our payroll, um, all that just gives the Cuban government a reason to be repressive toward anybody that dissents from them. So it doesn't promote democracy and human rights. Um, and Cubans, they need help. They need syringes. They've got the vaccines. They don't have enough syringes because of this blockade. Um, and the Cuban revolution to me was throwing off foreign interference. Batista was a tool of the United States. That's who they threw off. And so I think continuing the revolution is continuing or discontinuing the U.S.'s sanctions against Cuba. Now, you know, in these recent demonstrations, I believe it's a fundamental human right to go out, demonstrate, petition your grievances to the government, and not face repression. So that doesn't mean I'm not critical of the Cuban government leadership in some respects, but you know, our primary responsibility in this country is to get our knee off the neck of Cuba. And that means lifting the sanctions. <clears throat> Dave, awesome. Howie Hawkins, how do you keep going when you know the oligarch or oligarchy has control of our government with their billions? Democrats are known for fixing their primaries. Third party is kept off the ballot. Well, those are the reasons I keep going. We got to change all that. And uh, yeah, if it was easy, we'd have done it by now. But um, that's what we're fighting. And until we win, we're not going to have a climate solution. We're not going to have everybody's basic material needs met. We're not going to get out of this crazy nuclear arms race and all the endless wars. And in fact, you know, if we don't do something quick, we're going to lose at least the appearance of an electoral democracy. You know, what the Republicans are doing in the states and the Democrats seem unable or unwilling to stop. So I, I just keep going because, you know, you just laid out what, what the problem is and what we need to do. And, I, you know, just to say a little bit more about that, um, part of what keeps me going is just knowing history. Most movements, you know, push and push and push and don't seem to be getting anywhere until suddenly they break through. And uh, that's just been the history of movements of all kinds throughout history. So that's one thing you got to keep in mind. Um, the other is, you know, I understand the power structure in the United States. And it's not as invincible as it looks. It's lost legitimacy. And part of that, you know, people that don't respect it have moved to the right. But the left, you know, has something to say about that, too. So that means we're in a situation where, you know, while it looks like the rich got all the money and they bought both parties, the base, the people are skeptical. So that's that puts us in a time of that's ripe for change. So those are a couple of things that uh, keep me going. So that's one hour. I don't see any more questions. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, this COVID problem is ramping up again. I saw some numbers yesterday that the number of people getting COVID is higher than it was during the summer wave last summer now. This is really serious. And this Delta variant uh, may be more deadly. It's certainly more contagious by many many times. So, you know, I urge people that they haven't get the vaccination. And uh, a lot of places are, you know, reinstalling, you know, masks for indoor events. Uh, I think that's what needs to be done. 
I'm kind of tired of hearing from people that are opposed to vaccinations or mask mandates. You know, these are public health measures. I mean, they say we're taking their freedom. Well, if I have a business, don't I have the freedom to uh, make sure everybody in, inside is there's not a typhoid Mary in there making all my customers sick? And the idea that these are big uh, incursions on our civil liberties. I mean, next thing these people will be saying is, we don't have to drive on the right side of the road because I feel like driving on the left side of the road. And you're impairing my civil liberties. I mean, this can get ridiculous. So I'm, re I'm really tired of hearing that. Um, so I'm just saying, you know, be careful out there. And, uh, you know, it, it, it could get worse in the fall. The kids are going back to school. They're not vaccinated. And we got geniuses like this guy, Santos, and Florida Governor Santos, you know, basically prohibiting local school boards and schools and municipalities from mandating masks for settings like school. I mean, he's setting up people to die. And I think that's uh, totally shameful. So anyway, be careful out there. Have a good week and we'll see you next week.